Yep. Welcome back, dear Chaplain Ward. Thank you. We had a very, very interesting conversation in the first part, and I'm sure you have many, many moving and uh, challenging things to share with us uh, now. Uh, at that time, we discussed about the different branches of the chaplaincy mm -hmm. uh, in the American context. Yes. Uh, we left uh, aside one, and we we'll dedicate the, the, this uh, conversation to that. Uh, working as a chaplain in the hospital environment. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, you, you began already doing something close to that uh, when you were for the first time in the Air Force mm -hmm. uh, as a very, very young, uh, young man. What kind of, uh, of work did you have uh, during that time related to the medical mm -hmm. activity? When I was in the military in the United States Air Force, <clears throat> I was 17 when I was in the Air Force, and I became a medical corpsman and trained to work in the hospital as a medical assistant, assisting the nurses. I later trained to be a paramedic, an emergency medical technician and paramedic in the uh, Air Force. Would you explain the term paramedic? So the paramedic learns to suture or sew people up oh. if they need to, oh. uh, administer shots mm -hmm. of medication on the direction of the nurse or the physician, um, to also work in the back of the ambulance during a trauma, a, an emergency, a traffic accident, a woman given the emergency birth. Mm -hmm. um, you're able to work and sustain the person's life with advanced life training. Uh, you're able to do that and to manage the person in the back of the ambulance until you reach the hospital. So I was trained to do that, to stop bleeding, to mm -hmm. set broken bones, to do what I needed to do. And I was also trained to drive the ambulance if I would need to do that part. Mm -hmm. So I enjoyed that because I was able to turn on the siren <laughs> and zip through traffic, you know. So, uh, but I was trained to work in the emergency room. Yeah. Uh, Yes. Uh, doing what you just described, mm -hmm. you were alone or always under the direction of a nurse uh, or a physician? Well, when we would go out on emergency calls, uh, it was myself and the driver who was also a so uh, yeah, yeah, transport yeah. person or medical technician or a paramedic. And so we're, there were always two of us together, uh, but we were in contact with mm -hmm. the hospital through a two-way radio system yeah, so yeah. the nurse or the physician could talk with us uh, if there was anything about medication management or any procedures we needed to do or to read to them any vital signs that we were getting and then they were able to communicate with us back sure. and forth. And uh, you also did about the same in the, on the medical plane? On, on, on well, in the medical air evac. So I was also mm -hmm. an air evacuation um, medical corpsman where we would transport uh, people from hospital, military personnel from hospital to hospital from different locations. Mm -hmm. And on the plane, I was there to provide comfort and care for those who were injured or in need of medical care. And so I was a uh, on the plane nurse, if you would, and mm -hmm. providing care for them. Uh, if there was a medical emergency, uh, there were times when we did have a nurse on board with us. Sometimes even a, a, a physician would be with us. But other times it was basically the medical corpsman that were there. Uh, and so we were able to uh, provide care for those who were in transport to other hospitals. So at that time you came, uh, I suppose, quite close to people in utter distress, uh, mm -hmm. life-threatening situations because mm -hmm. ambulance or the yes. air vac was used for that, not right. for yes. mild situations. Yes, for yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So as su such a young uh, age, uh, yes, what, do you, young what age. do you remember about uh. you know, being caught in, in such traumatic and, you know, right. <laughs> uh, it was exciting, well, you yeah, know, when you're yeah, that young and yeah. you're afraid, mm -hmm. nervous. Uh, but I, I, I've always worked, I had a high school job where I worked in the hospital also. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, I've always liked the medical environment and the hospital. I've always been drawn to medical care and hospital care. And at one time in my life, I wanted to be a physician and go into the medical field. Um, so I uh, am, a, and I'm also a person who's comfortable around um, emergencies and I trauma. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't get overly excited, I have a pretty mm -hmm. calm mm -hmm. uh, 
demeanor. Mm -hmm. And so in those moments, <clears throat> I didn't find myself getting overly excited or nervous or anxious mm -hmm. as long as I knew I had backup. As mm -hmm. long as I could call the physician or yes. call the, the nurse mm -hmm. on, the, on the radio and get assistance, uh, I was uh, able to uh, fare quite well and do quite well in that position. Uh, but I did learn that after seeing as many emergencies and mm -hmm. wounds and bad accidents and caring for people, uh, and also there was sometimes people would die and there was death and mm -hmm. we had to prepare people for the morgue and transport them there. So after being in that emergency <laughs> traumatic environment, uh, at the time when I was a young man, I didn't know that working in that environment can really impact the mm -hmm. caregiver. Yes. And it can increase your stress level. Sure. Uh, it can contribute to something called compassion fatigue and mm -hmm. just give you a lot of traumatic stress and can lead to certain bouts with depression and other symptoms. Uh, because at that time, I didn't know well, how to take care of myself. Yes. I didn't know how to uh, nurture myself so that I could work in that intense environment. I later learned what I needed to do if I was going to work in very stressful environments. I also suppose uh, that uh, there was not much knowledge and discussion on that at that time. I think that came mm. little by little and mm. more recently. I, uh, I, in some of my research, I found that there was, oh, there uh, was. literature, but it's what not as widely distributed, uh, disseminated mm. as it is now, of course. Sure. And I really started to learn more about it around 1994. Mm -hmm. That's when I learned a lot more about uh, uh, high stress and how it can impact you and working in emergency environments and seeing traumatic events and uh, experiencing death and dying on a regular basis, the mm -hmm. impact it can have on the caregiver. Sure. Mm -hmm. uh, so I learned a lot more and started to educate myself um, and that was after my experience later in life working in the VA hospital with mm. Vietnam veterans. Speak on that. Well, when I um, finally went back into the military again after my undergraduate training and after my graduate training and pastoring, and I became a Navy chaplain, uh, I was assigned to a program, uh, and it's called Clinical Pastoral Education, Attention. which is CPE, CPE, which trains clergy persons who want to be chaplains how to work in a clinical environment uh, and understand that environment. And I worked at the VA, the Veterans Administration Physician. Hospital, which is a hospital for military veterans, men yes. and women who have served in the military and they now need medical care. So I served in the VA hospital in Hampton, Virginia, mm -hmm. in the United States. And I served on a team and worked as a chaplain for the post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD uh, team. These are military men and women who have PTSD from being in combat, from being in war, and it has traumatized them. And there are certain symptoms uh, that plague their life and lead them to some dysfunctions in their life. And so there is a mental health uh, group that meets on a regular basis uh, and we provide therapy and counseling for these men and women who have PTSD. And as I sat as part of that group and listened to their stories, which were very graphic at times, mm. I learned that I was beginning to exhibit some of the same symptoms and signs and symptoms that yes, these men and mm. women had, and I had never been in war. I'd never been to Vietnam. And I learned from my supervisor, who was a psychologist, therapist, she said to me that you have to learn to take care of yourself because as you listen to trauma and as you hear these graphic stories repeating over and over, that can actually traumatize you, you emotionally, mentally, and you can start to internalize what you're hearing and you will start to exhibit signs and symptoms as if you have been mm -hmm. traumatized. And that's acute traumatic stress disorder or secondary stress. I'm secondarily being traumatized mm -hmm. by what I'm hearing. Sure. And we can also be traumatized by what we see. Mm -hmm. When I was a paramedic, right, mm -hmm. people were, there was bleeding and there were bones protruding and gruesome things and death and dying. And so what I learned to do was to take really good care of myself, take breaks from that type of work, make sure I had someone to process with to have what someone, I was seeing, to someone, have someone that I could talk with, yes. 
but uh, not just everyone. No, but someone who's <laughs> trained to hear what I'm, I'm, I'm seeing and help me to make sense of it, mm-hmm. right? It's also important to take breaks. It's, it's also important to take care of yourself uh, physically, physically. Health. exercising, health-wise, drinking water, getting enough sleep, and getting away from that environment is, is very important but doing really good self-care, right? Even Jesus said after a long day of ministering to people, if you remember, he said, we're going to come aside for a while. We're going to go to the mountains and we're going to relax. You cannot continue to pour yourself out, caring for others without it taking a toll on yourself. So I learned to take care of myself so I could be more present, with the individuals who are hurting and in despair. So that may sound a little self-centered or egoistical, but it is not, uh, I mean, it can be done. Yes, it can be yes, done yes, like that, yes, but yes, yes. it can be done, it, yes, should, be done it should be done, as uh, sharpening your tools yes. for better service. Yes, yes. So we've all, most of us have flown on, on airplanes, and oftentimes the flight attendant giving instruction says if there's a problem, mm-hmm. the oxygen mask will drop down mm-hmm. and you place it on. Well, if you have someone sitting next to you Take care who's, first of yourself. who's injured or yeah. who's in need, who gets it first? You, you do. For you. So for that yourself. you can be stronger to take to care of the person yeah, yeah. who is in need. Yeah, yeah, so you yeah. have to stop and take care of yourself so that you can be better prepared to care for others. If you don't take care of yourself, who is going to take care of the weaker? That's right, that's right. So you you have to be able to do that. So I learned that lesson. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was not very, very close to the to the ending of the Vietnam War. It had been quite a, quite no, a time of it. Quite a while, yes. But yeah, still people still. were suffering yes. and ruminating through the same memories yes. and being... This was 1994-95 and so you know they had been out of Vietnam since the, 20, the late 60s yeah, and you know early 70s. For, and to, so they were still plagued by the memories hmm. uh, that of, of the things that they saw and what happened. Yeah, as, and as a yeah. chaplain uh, I mean, you were not the 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 ther- the, the therapist. Right. The, you were not the counselor. Mm-hmm. You were working with them, but mm-hmm. having a distinctive role. Yes. What was your distinctive role in relation to the mm-hmm. patients? Well, since I had a background and training in my undergrad, theology and psychology, and uh, I was able to uh, learn counseling techniques and be trained in sure. therapy uh, techniques, but not represented there as a therapist. I was there as a chaplain who had an understanding of psychological models and PTSD and what could happen. Sure. But these men and women needed to struggle with God. <laughs> Many of them were angry with God. Angry. Angry because they made it out and their friends didn't or angry because they had to go in the first place, Mm -hmm. angry because maybe God allowed the war to happen. Mm -hmm. And so they saw me as God's representative in their support groups. And so oftentimes I would hear and hold in a container, if you will, Mm -hmm. their anger towards God Mm -hmm. and help them to, to work through that anger and that frustration with God and to understand the mercy and compassion of God and that God is the giver of all good things and not of bad things. And things in this world happen because men and women make poor decisions. And we go into war and conflict and we harm each other. And we can't always blame God for that. Right? Mm-hmm. But I was there to walk with them and be a presence, a spiritual presence, that God has not abandoned you. God loves you. And he's going to be with you through this and to the end. And so that was my, my work. Uh, but I, I would have uh, private sessions, individual sessions, listening to them, praying with them and their families because the families mm-hmm. often struggle sure. with their PTSD. The families struggle with that. And so I was able also to have times of, of counseling with uh, the spouses and with the children. And that was very helpful. I suppose patients in a VA hospital, especially at uh, such a distant time from the actual combat, mm-hmm. 
uh, they may stay for longer periods in the hospital compared to the usual turnover of patients in a regular hospital. It varied. It varied. It varied. Uh, yeah, some were there actually uh, admitted to the psychiatric unit mm -hmm. and for, for longer, longer stays. Stay. Some were on an outpatient, so they would come uh -huh. and sit through the groups and receive medication, and then they would they would go back home so on an outpatient basis. So, so it varied. Yeah, it varied uh, somewhat, yes. Uh, but uh, you did uh, uh, interact with patients who have been, who were there for a longer period of yes. time, so mm -hmm. interacting multiple times yes. and observing, uh, hopefully, positive transformations mm -hmm. from one session to the next. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. And, and uh, it gave me an opportunity to build relationships. To build relationships, to which is not, excuse me, which is not the case in a regular hospital environment where <laughs> yes. it's very... Very quick, especially yeah. today. Yeah. Uh, people come and maybe stay two have or three a, days at the have most a procedure. and they're, they're gone. They get yeah. a procedure and they're gone. Mm -hmm. And so when you have long-term care, mm -hmm. a person stays longer, you can build more of a relationship, mm -hmm. which helps you to build trust, mm -hmm. uh, which helps you to build maybe a friendship and start to... Uh, have more inroads and better opportunities to discuss deeper issues with the individual. Uh, and so that's what happened often with those who were there longer. So part of the uh, anger and uh, bitterness were toward God and you sometimes as a perceived representative of mm -hmm. God. But I suppose uh, the, uh, pa another part of the anger was blaming themselves uh, and uh, having a, a troubled conscience, is that true? If so, what Some were, over some what they did mm -hmm. or did not do did not or know. Yeah, yeah. mistakes or accidents they made mm -hmm. and they were holding on for years. Mm -hmm. And um, so it was, it was uh, one young man I remembered, he mm -hmm. made a mistake and mm -hmm. he fell asleep while he was on guard duty. Mm -hmm. And the base he was on was pretty much overrun by the enemy. Mm -hmm. And um, he felt he was directly responsible because he fell asleep on sure. his watch. Mm. And he'd been holding that for years and years and so much anguish mm -hmm. uh, because there was loss of life. Mm. And so we were able to talk through that and to pray. And his need was not so much for God's forgiveness, to forgive himself. but to forgive himself. Mm. And it was amazing because the transformation in the group, the group forgave him. Oh. And these were fellow combat veterans mm. and as they listened to his story and as they talked together they were able to say to him you know we forgive you and that helped him speak, in his process of forgiving himself speak more on this group uh, dynamics mm -hmm. uh, when you said uh, they have been with him i suppose they have not been in that incident in that incident mm -hmm. but they all related uh, yeah. so in this particular support group the only way that you could be a member of this particular group you had to be a combat veteran. Mm -hmm. And uh, they were all combat veterans and mm -hmm. had been in actual combat, yeah, but yeah. not necessarily at the same places. Sure, sure. So, but they could relate and understand mm -hmm. uh, to combat and what an individual goes through in those mm -hmm. experiences. And so they formed a very close knit mm -hmm. and, and tight group. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, after that, you began working in a regular hospital. After uh, separating from the military, I uh, wanted to be back into hospital. Yes. I, I enjoy working in the hospitals. I, I feel like that is a place to be every day, uh, cutting edge, making a difference. Mm -hmm. And you know, people don't raise their hands and say, today I think I want to go to the hospital. I just want to go hang out <laughs> at the hospital. <laughs> people come to the hospital because there's a need. Yeah. Right? There's a need. And so when they come, I like being there for them. I like supporting them through that. I like being their hospital chaplain or hospital pastor. I like supporting that family as they're going through that journey with their loved one. I like supporting the staff, the doctors and nurses and pharmacists and technicians who are there to provide great care, whole person care, the ministry of Christ to heal this person. And I like encouraging the staff and reminding them that they have to take care of themselves, mm -hmm. uh, step back, take a vacation, get some rest, make sure you get enough sleep, because I want them to be the best they can be every day that they come to the work at the hospital. And so I uh, went back into hospital care as a chaplain, 
with children's health care advances? Excuse me, it was a choice, or it was the, as you mentioned in mm -hmm. the other program, a door which had been open. Mm -hmm. It was and, a choice. And to so working. we chose to, uh, my wife and I, uh, she had, has been with me now for 30 years, mm -hmm. and um, we almost decided to just stay in a foreign country in the military once we separated and just lived, but we wanted to come back home, and she wanted our children who were young age to be raised with family. Um, oftentimes, military members travel so much and they can be disconnected from family. She wanted our kids to be raised with their cousins and aunts and uncles and all, and she wanted to come back home. And so we made a choice to travel back to Atlanta after I applied at several places. And uh, the hospital in Atlanta chose uh, to hire me to be a chaplain there. Uh, which we were very happy since this is home, Atlanta is home. And I spent 14 and a half years there as a mm -hmm. hospital chaplain in uh, pediatric chaplaincy with children, uh, in oncology service, cancer. All that period in the oncology? <clears throat> yes, mm -hmm. and uh, also blood disorders with mm -hmm. patients, children um, who have uh, sickle cell disease, mm -hmm. which is a very painful, very painful uh, illness. And so in those environments, and also in the emergency trauma environment uh, in pediatrics as well. What is specific for, for working with children in the hospital environment with uh, life-threatening conditions, mm -hmm. lethal conditions as you, mm -hmm. terminal uh, cases, yes. yeah, mm -hmm. and their families. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned already a little bit about general hospital, uh, but what is different with children, small children? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, yeah. I, I said small, but probably not just small. Well, they can go up to 22. If up the, to if 22. The, if the, if the, if the, mm -hmm. the uh, physician wants to continue to see them at 20, 21, 22, often many make a transition then over to adult oh, hospitals. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you do have adolescents and mm -hmm. you have... Uh, the younger children. So and it's quite different yes, from, from and uh, of course, uh, yes, you have the, the little infants from in the uh, needle natal uh, ICU, mm -hmm. in the NICU uh, clinics, and little children with, with illnesses. And I think one of the toughest experiences yes. I, I ever had was when I first started working in the pediatric environment as a chaplain, which I'd never been in before. I remember I was a duty chaplain, the chaplain on call. So yes. If there was a need in the entire hospital and there wasn't a chaplain to respond, they would call me. Yes. <clears throat> excuse me. I walked into, <clears throat> excuse me, the cardiac intensive care unit, and there was this little baby. And as I approached the bed of where the baby was and the nurse was standing there, the baby had a strip, a wide strip of tape across uh, her heart. Mm -hmm. And you could see the heart beating. Oh, my. You know? And I stopped, and I turned around, <laughs> and I left out. <laughs> I was not ready for that. I, Even I, after being in traumatic, oh, uh, I'm yeah, in trauma. I know, in the, I thought I could handle the, it. Yeah, but, but that think, was too much. I think it was too much because it was a child. It was an infant. And I was learning to be in this pediatric, and to see all of the illnesses and injuries that can befall children. And before, you know, I was always with adults. <clears throat> and periodically, <clears throat> excuse me, I would have children that would come into the hospital that we would, in emergency room, of course, with injuries. But this was all children in the pediatric environment. Sure. And um, so in oncology, that was the first experience with large numbers of children who have cancer. Hmm. Life-threatening, potentially life-ending. Ending. And to see their journey was difficult. And I remember for the first six months, my stress level was very high mm. because I hadn't experienced those emotions before around children sick, in pain, their parents by the bedside every day, pleading with God, begging God, bargaining with God, hoping that a miracle would happen, and struggling as they would see life leaving their mm. child. Because mm. many of us, if not all of us, at some point probably believe that children should not die before their parents. Sure. 
But in that environment, it happens, it all, the happens all the time. And sometimes the physicians have to remind us as a staff, the nurses and chaplains and social workers, they would say, you have to remember that oftentimes children do die, die. pass away before their parents. Mm -hmm. And I think it's one of the most difficult and toughest experiences of any human experience is for a parent to lose their child. Um, that is excruciating. Mm -hmm. I was reading this book once and it says there are two cries of a woman that are distinct from any other cry. The moment they give birth and when their child dies. Mm -hmm. And I have experienced mothers and fathers who have, when they were given the news that there's nothing else we could do, and when the child passes away and the doctor has to call it and say, that's it. I have seen mothers screech, send a sound that pierced the walls of the hospital. And I've also seen mothers when they were so quiet and like butter melting off of a hot knife, they just melt it down to the floor in a ball and would cry. And I've seen fathers when they would take their fists after hearing the news and they lose their child, they would take their fists and punch a wall and break the bones in their hand. <laughs> or they would sit and weep uncontrollably. And it's very difficult with men also because, you know, men, we like to fix things. Yeah. And they, you can't fix anything. You can't fix that. There are things that we can't fix. And so men struggle. It's hard for them to be in that environment. So I think being with children, it takes a lot of patience. But it takes, you, it takes emotional care of yourself. Because when you're providing hospital care for children, children bring with them their own emotional tug at your heart. When you see an adult with cancer or a blood disorder or an illness, you know, you feel compassion, but you say, well, that person has lived their life. Yeah. You know, they're an adult, and we're going to do the best we can to help them to survive and continue to live. But when you see children, they're just starting, and it's more difficult, right? And so as it is more difficult, uh, you have to take really good care of yourself. Uh, you have to process what you're seeing, what you're feeling with professionals and with colleagues so that you can stay focused on, on that, right? So it is a tough environment, and I remind parents that you have to take care of yourself. Parents will give their all. They don't want to leave the hospital. They don't want to leave the bedside. Yes, yes. And they will waste away sitting right there. And so you have to remind parents that for you to be the best that you can be by your child's side now, you have to take care of yourself. You have to go home and sleep. You have to... Uh, eat and you have to drink water and you, you have to take care of life. You can't stop. And so mm. it's a different environment. Maybe they drill that something could happen the very moment the very they are moment not they there. Walk out. Yes. And so for that parent, mm. I would always say to them, this is now a faith walk for you. A faith walk. Mm -hmm. Do you have faith in God? Mm -hmm. And so if you are afraid to leave your child's bedside, because something may happen when you're not here, does that show faith in God? Hmm. You cannot control every event. And your being by the bedside 24 hours a day, seven days a week, will not sustain, nor stop, nor prevent, right? But it will break you down uh -huh. and take its toll on you, right? Hmm. And so parents have to gather enough faith and trust in God that whatever outcome is in his will, and we have to trust him. Easier said than done. Oh, right? For sure. Yes. And uh, there is a long process. So speaking on parents, probably in the beginning they tend to, to deny mm -hmm. the reality. And so it's a long process. Mm -hmm. That they have so, to work through. Yeah, speak more yeah. on that. Yeah. And I think it's almost like the process of, of death and dying that uh, Kubler-Ross, Dr. Mm -hmm. Kubler-Ross talked about those five stages. Yes. Uh, and it's, the child has not died, but 
parents go through that denial and that anger and that bargaining Ding. and you know all of that process of struggling with what's happening to their children. Uh, and so I, 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 I think that you know one, one emotion that many families express when their child uh, had cancer, has a diagnosis of cancer, they start to feel a sense of guilt. What did I do? Yes. How could I have prevented yeah, this? Yeah. You so know? you want to make sense? Try what, to make what, sense of it. What happened? Yes. To who is yes. to be blamed? And there's uh, bargaining that happens. Yeah. Lord, take this illness and place it on me and take it off of my child. Mm. So they get into the bargaining. Let's return to that uh, blaming themselves or questioning, uh, mm -hmm. uh, doubting uh, themselves. Uh, sometimes, of course, we, we can detect some something we did wrong and if I go on the red light uh, mm -hmm. and something happened mm -hmm. uh, the cause it's very mm -hmm. obvious mm -hmm. but in cases like that when a child has cancer is it always possible to, to point out yeah this was my mistake or mm -hmm. who, who, is always that yeah. clear <laughs> I don't I don't think it is I'm I'm not remembering times when it was that clear yes, or it yes, was to be yes. pointed out yeah, that yeah. a decision was made or not made. Um, we don't understand we cancer. We don't understand. We don't oh, have a cure yeah. for cancer. We have uh, innovative and exciting treatments that are coming. That are fabulous, helping, fabulous treatments, you know, by the way. Helping, but but um, the, the real, so, the real yeah. under... But and to the pinning causes. To, yeah, a moment of time or an act or a decision. It's and so, heavy. what I would try to help parents do mm -hmm. is to focus on the here and the now. Mm -hmm. How can I help my child to be comfortable, to have a, as normal a life as possible, and to celebrate their life for whatever amount of time mm -hmm. I have, and to continue to be hopeful as long as there's breath in their body, mm -hmm. their heart is beating, to be hopeful. And I always would say to parents, there are two things that you need to get through these moments when your child is diagnosed with cancer. You need good medicine mm. and you need good prayers. Mm. You need both. You need the power of God because God has given men and women the knowledge to practice medicine. And you need prayer to bring you close to God, mm. to have those moments of conversation that only you and God can understand. Yeah, but sometimes so that's the, the sore spot because yes. they, they probably uh, people need to, to, assign, to assign guilt or responsibility. If they are not responsible, then who? Who else? Then God. Mm -hmm. God, why? Right. Why yes. did you do that yes. to us? Yes, yes. So yes. What, what do you do when mm -hmm. parents blame God? Well, it's it's so know, easy to say, no, no, this is not God. Is not, <laughs> you are wrong, you are wrong. Don't say that. Yes, yes. God will punish you. <laughs> yes. Well, you know, I grew up as a child um, always being told, never question God. Uh -huh. Never ask why. Uh -huh. Just accept. Accept, yeah. But I believe, I've grown to believe that my mm -hmm. God is bigger than that. <laughs> he allowed Job to ask why. Many, many Job, questions. Job didn't ask. He didn't understand. <laughs> yeah. I've been a good man. I have taken care of my family. I talk about you everywhere I go. I, 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 and so on and so forth, right? So Job didn't understand exactly what God was doing. Yeah. And God had to help him to understand God that. didn't tell him, shut up. Yeah, he, he allowed him <laughs> to talk and continue. Now, at some moment, he eventually, God eventually arrived at a moment yes. when he had allowed Job to talk and his friends. He said, okay, now I need you to listen. And I'm going to help you to understand what has happened to you. And so I think God does that in those quiet moments with parents. That he gives them a certain peace that only he can give them. But I think struggling with God and asking that question of why, uh, it's okay. It's okay. I think being angry with God is okay. God is big enough to handle that. Do you dare say that again? You know? Yes, God <laughs> is big enough to, ha to handle that, you know. Uh, God is big enough for you to question Him. So He's but, all right when we question yes, Him. Yes, I think He's all right with that. I mm -hmm. really do. Uh, because God knows that we don't understand why all the things that happen mm -hmm. in this world happen. Mm -hmm. We can point to sin and say, well... Centuries, centuries ago, Adam and Eve made a decision that brought a curse upon us, and we're still living under that yes. until God comes back and changes it. Mm -hmm. 
But there are things we don't know and we don't understand. In Deuteronomy, I believe it's 29, 29, 29 says yeah, the yeah, secret yeah. things belong to God. But the things he's revealed to us belongs to us and to our children. So that we can obey. Yes. We can follow him. There are things that are secret that we don't know, yeah. that God has not revealed to us yes. everything. Yes. Uh, and so we have to be okay with mm -hmm. that. We have to say that I don't know it all and God has not shared everything with me. There's another text in Isaiah that says that God's thoughts are higher than my thoughts and his ways are different than mine because he's holy and I'm not. And I'm sinful, and I'm being changed, and I've been forgiven, and I'm becoming like Christ. But I still have my human thoughts and my human frailties, right? And finite thought. I can't go as far as God can go. Mm -hmm. I can't see the end from the beginning, mm -hmm. but God can. So I always try to help parents to see that we don't always know and understand the will and providence of God, but we trust Him. It was a dear lady who told me when I was 16, one of my best friend's mm -hmm. mother, and she was ill, and eventually she was going to pass away, and she knew that. And on her sick bed, I remember she said to us as we were standing around, she said, God is too good to do anything wrong, and he's too wise to make a mistake, oh, yeah. and I'm going to trust him to the day I die. Mm -hmm. I never forgot that. Sure. I think that comes from the desire of ages. Okay. So yeah. it was a powerful yeah, statement. Yeah. So she reminded us. Yeah. And and, uh, so uh, naturally we tend, when someone is questioning God or is angry at God, we tend either to reprove, uh, to reprove mm -hmm. or to take distance. Mm -hmm. We don't like to, yes. to stay close. We become uncomfortable, to, you know, we become uncomfortable yeah. because we love God. We trust God, yes. at least in our good times. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And yes. what is, is there a better thing to do than to try to straighten them up or to take distance? Is there a better way? Hmm. I don't know if I would categorize it as a better way, <laughs> but I can share with you my way. Yes. And what I tend to do as a chaplain is my ministry, like all chaplains, is a ministry of presence. Of presence. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. Chaplains believe that we come alongside people in their most difficult moments. And we're not there to direct them to a point or mm -hmm. to take them to a point. Mm -hmm. We are there to be with them in the midst of whatever they're feeling, mm -hmm. whatever they're going through, and to travel with them on that journey. To be a silent partner, maybe, or a compassionate listener. Our ministry is to receive whatever they are experiencing and hold it as a sacred container of this person's most intimate and maybe even troubling and difficult thoughts at that moment. And by being there as a presence of God and silently being there and witnessing and maybe giving appropriate comments we're allowing them to work through their feelings and work through what they're thinking with someone there, not challenging them, not directing them, mm -hmm. not judging them, not distancing ourselves from them, but staying with them in the midst of those difficult moments and saying, I will not leave you. Mm -hmm. I'm here. Struggle. And as you struggle, I will struggle with you. Mm -hmm. I've cried with patients and mm -hmm. families. Mm -hmm. You know, I've gotten angry with patients and families mm -hmm. and they got angry like, God, what's going on? You know, uh, but I think a chaplain's role is to be there when they reach that point of difficulty and they need to ask. Or when it needs to be a silent moment and you only hold their hand. Mm -hmm. Or when there needs to be so a it's, tear. It's, so it's okay to be silent. It's okay. It's okay, okay to be silent. And I think Ministry of presence is best to be silent. You know, we tend to to look like that, uh, you know, dismissive with the the friends of Job who have been silent for a long time. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, that was compassion. It was. And I think we often overlook that. And I'm so glad you pointed it out. You know, Job's friends came to be with him mm -hmm. in a very difficult time, and there are times when they did a lot of talking. Yeah. Right. <laughs> But there are times when they sat and they were just silent and they didn't leave his side. Mm -hmm. And I think that was very meaningful and powerful mm -hmm. for us to witness that, that in the midst of Job's misery and, you know, sickness and questioning, they stayed with him. 
probably they did it better when they were silent. When they were silent, you know. <laughs> they were silent. It allowed him to... To you know, grieve, to... Yes. To, and sometimes we need people to, to witness cry, that, yeah. to witness that struggle without commenting. Mm. And I think there are times when the most powerful uh, gift you can give a person is your silence. Yeah. Your presence and your silence and just being with them. Can you share with us maybe some memories, some, you know, about parents going through this... Mm-hmm. There are many. Um, there's one that comes to mind. What I grew to be amazed by was the resilience of children. Mm-hmm. Children who are experiencing excruciating pain because of sickle cell disease. Mm-hmm. Or children who are going through a bone marrow transplant and they lose all of their hair and they have tubes and lines coming out. and They're so resilient. Excuse me, the word resilience yes. is very difficult to be translated okay. in Romanian. Right. Would you like to explain it a little bit? Yes. So resilience is when you have the inner strength to bounce back. Mm-hmm. When you have the inner strength to keep going and it's been tough mm-hmm. and you haven't quit. It's when you have a hardiness and a toughness but also you're able to continue to laugh and to find joy Mm -hmm. and harmony and balance in Mm -hmm. your life. Mm -hmm. And so we become resilient. Resilience is like a rubber band. (laughs) Yeah, that's a good image. It's flexible. Yes. And able to... You you may return to your initial uh, form. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. And so that difficult moment stretched Mm -hmm. you, Mm -hmm. but you're back. Yeah, yeah. And so we develop resilience. And so you observe children, that in children. I observe that in children. That's one. And I would often encourage their parents by saying to the parents, your child is very resilient, mm. able to take a lot and come back smiling. Mm. And I would say to them, where do you think she got that from? <laughs> That's from you. <laughs> and parents, you know, they like that because... The child has learned from their parents, yeah. whether innately or mm-hmm. through it's teaching. A, yeah, they've yeah. learned to be resilient. Mm-hmm. And oftentimes, I would see children who would minister to their parents. Really? Yes. So there was a, if I could share one, one memory with you. We were called to the pediatric intensive care unit. The child was probably about nine years old. Mm. She was not going to live. She wasn't mm-hmm. going to live. She wasn't going to make it. And we all knew. She's just a darling, darling little girl. Her mother had been by her side. Her father had been by her side, brothers and sisters. And now we're in intensive care unit. And she has a short time. And as the, the physician is standing there, the nurse is standing there, the chaplain, I'm there, um, others are there, and we're in the room. Her mother is holding her in her, in her arms. And her breathing is rather labored. And she looks up at her mother. And she says, Mommy, it's time. Mm-hmm. Mommy, it will be okay. A few minutes after that, she took she her last breath. At that moment, she ministered to us, to all of us. At that moment, she prepared her mom for the inevitable. And she said to mom, it's okay. And she said, I remember, she had a smile on her face. And I think that helped mom and dad and all of us along that journey that we were now on, which was grieving her loss. And I've seen children, how they would encourage their parents. And they were young and kids. So children are very resilient, and they would go through all those exams and treatments Mm -hmm. and bounce back again, and you see them playing in the hallways. It seems to me, uh, my limited observations and uh, your much more extensive experience, that children... uh, with extended periods of suffering, mm. they come early to maturity, to mm. uh, yes. Un, yes. Un, un, yes. 
unexplainable good observation yes yeah. and i think i think even if you look at adults struggle yeah, yeah. tends to mature us and harden us to be able to face life's life's tough knocks and so these children go through uh, their illness especially when it's long term and they struggle and they interact so much with uh, the seriousness of trying to beat this illness and to to fight it off that they mature and I also think that they and I have seen that they seem to develop a close relationship with Jesus Tell more about that. Many of the children, and I write about this in uh, the book that I co-authored with a friend, how we both would encounter young people who seem to have this amazing relationship with Jesus mm -hmm. as a friend. Mm -hmm. And it, it appeared that Jesus had an amazing relationship with them. Um, and they would often talk of seeing angels, or they would often talk of speaking to Jesus, and mm -hmm. how he would say something to them, or interactions with the holy um, and we tend to want to question that but here's a child here's an adolescent and teenagers tend to not talk a lot about religion but in those moments you start to hear these testimonies and witnessing about what they've seen and heard in heaven and the experience with angels and with Jesus and how he's held their hand or comforted them and so I just came to understand and accept for myself that in those moments, Jesus has a special relationship with children and they have a special relationship with him. And I just trusted that as God's ministry to them at those moments. Something comes to my mind, maybe it's a little, a little out of place, but I dare to say it. I recently heard a story, a humorous story. Mm -hmm. It was a drawing class, and the teacher went from student to student, mm -hmm. you know, first grades, uh, looking what they were trying to, to draw, and uh, with a girl he was not able to, to recognize, and uh, he asked the, the girl, what are you going to, to do here? And he said, uh, a picture of God. Mm -hmm. And the teacher said, yes, but... Uh, Nobody actually know how mm -hmm. God looks like. Well, the girl said, they'll learn in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> but now in this context, yes. in yeah. this context, mm -hmm. it becomes very serious. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Yeah, I think it's the innocence of children and the innocence of their relationship and with Christ. Yes, you they know. may teach us yeah. things about God. Yeah. We don't know. We don't know. Well, it was Jesus who said, except you be as little children. Yes. You know, and um, so we're called to have that simplicity. And, he's, he's, and he spoke about the, the special care, the special, mm -hmm. and he gave in the Bible special revelations to children. Yes, very much so. Like uh, Samuel. Mm -hmm. and Call him uh, at a very young age. Yeah, yeah. Special. Samuel heard the voice of God when his prophet and leader and yeah, the yeah. adult did but the yeah. child did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So special relationships. So, so it was a very meaningful uh, relationship working in the hospital, being there and seeing the children who had sickle cell disease where the, the blood cell it becomes sickled and it's mm -hmm. hard to pass through and becomes mm -hmm. very excruciatingly painful where they would live with this pain and they were able to as children to be resilient with that pain to go through life, you know, and so you see how tough kids become. Hmm. Tough in the sense of uh, strong, 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 and, and able to able to take, able to take, take it and, and pain, keep, and keep moving, and yeah. you know. And then during the summer months, we would have a camp. We have summer camp for the kids. Really? And so you would see the kids the weeks before they pushing their IV poles, or they're taking oh, medicine, or they're sick. Oh. But then you would see all these kids at the camp. Fantastic. And it was so much fun because they were running and jumping oh. and, and acting like, you know, just regular no, kids, right? Normal kids. And, and the kids who were having a little difficulty and had to be in wheelchairs, mm -hmm. you know, other kids were pushing them all oh. around. And so they had a chance to be children. To, to be children, to enjoy life, to, enjoy to, life. to when they live, to live with happy yes. memories. Yes. 
and they were able to come with their, uh, if they had siblings, their siblings mm -hmm. were able to come to, to camp with to join them. them. And we had nurses mm -hmm. and doctors who were mm -hmm. on staff during the camp, so if a kid needed it. Uh, I have loved to, to be able also to, to, to speak on, on taking care of the staff, physicians, mm -hmm. nurses, caretakers, yes. but our time unfortunately is up. Uh, for the few minutes remaining, I'd like to, to, to speak again. Uh, maybe to go deeper about ways in which you have been transformed in your interactions with uh, children and families. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe, maybe a story. And, uh, yeah. Well, I think when I first started um, <clears throat> working in the hospital as a chaplain in the pediatric environment, and I began mm -hmm. to experience daily children who were sick and ill and suffering and recovering and the good and the bad. My kids were young. Oh. They were probably at the age, if I can remember exactly, they were um, maybe kindergarten, first mm -hmm. grade, mm -hmm. kindergarten and mm -hmm. second grade, mm -hmm. young. Mm -hmm. And so every day that I would come home from work for several weeks or months, at night, I couldn't sleep. Mm -hmm. I would wake up, go into their rooms, watch them to make sure they were breathing. <sighs> and one day, I was at the hospital, and I was sharing this with a colleague. And one of the physicians heard me, and he said, "You're going to have to stop doing that." He said, "You're going to have to trust and believe that your children are all right." <laughs> He said, when I first started in pediatrics, mm -hmm. you know, did the same. I thought my kids would have every illness out there. <laughs> <laughs> my child said, oh, I have a headache. Oh, he's got a brain tumor. You know, so mm -hmm. it would exaggerate it. So I began to overprotect my kids, and I had to stop doing that. Mm -hmm. So it was a faith journey for me. Mm -hmm. it, was a, it was a trust journey uh, for me to say, God, you love them more than I ever could protect them, watch over them, mm -hmm. whatever comes, you'll be with us. So I learned to sort of let go of that and I stopped waking up at night <laughs> checking to see if they were breathing and I was thankful for that. But I learned how uh, tough it is and such a struggle on families when their children have long-term illnesses yeah. or life-threatening illnesses yeah, yeah, yeah. and that it can pull the mom and dad apart. Yeah. They begin to place so much emphasis on the child who's ill. They neglect they put each all other. all their energies, they start to neglect each other. Or uh, they get upset by different reactions. And they start to blame each other. Yeah, yeah. And so I actually began to see that a lot. And it uh, said to me that I need to keep an open communication with my spouse, with my mm. wife. And when we have these trials together, we need to talk about it and pray about it. And we need to find counseling mm -hmm. if it's tough enough. Mm -hmm. And so I started a counseling program for husbands and wives, parents, mm -hmm. so I could help them through that journey. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so it's just a very tough journey for parents to go through. And for those who did lose their child, every year we would celebrate the mm -hmm. lives of the children who died the mm -hmm. year before. Yeah. And sometimes that could be 35, 40 kids. And that's a large number. And we would seek to help the parents to know or to believe that life goes on. Yeah. You have other children. Yeah. You have to provide for them. Don't give up. You know, and for those who were Christian, there's the resurrection. resurrection. Live your life now so that you will see the so, child again. So that's very precious because uh, while uh, uh, we have to learn to live with stress and uh, 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 have trust, we can't rule out mm -hmm. the possibility that something could be wrong with us or with our yes. children. We can't rule yes. out. No. We, we yes. have no, no right. protection. Yeah. And I mean, yeah, and uh, that, that tells us also mm -hmm. that we have to value this day. Yes. We have value to value this day. Yeah. Yes, value the time. One thing I say to young parents now, I say there are probably a lot of lessons or examples I can share with you now that I'm older, 
But there's one I want to share with you, one regret I have when it comes to my children mm -hmm. and when they were younger. I say that regret is I didn't sit on the floor and talk and play with them enough. Mm -hmm. On the floor. <laughs> Not towering over them, <laughs> right? Not telling them what to do, but just sit on the floor and laugh and play and talk. I wish I had done that more. Thank you very much, Chaplain, uh, for me, and I hope also for all of yours. Uh, this is going to be an unforgettable conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you. God bless God you bless. and your ministry. Thank you. Thank God you. bless you.